Ava, thank you for being here. Hi. Yes, thank you for having me. I love to be here. <laughs> Yay. I love to see you. I love that I've gotten to see you in person three times, maybe. Yeah. Um, and this is our second um, interview virtually. So you are the Advocacy and Community Director at Young People's Alliance. And can you tell listeners about what you guys do over there? Young People's Alliance is a student-led and student-run nonprofit uh, with the sole goal of making sure young people's voices are heard and policy conversations that affect them. Our core value is advocacy through lived experience. So we like to empower young people to advocate for things that affect them personally. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I came into this work, being someone that had been affected by social media. Uh, Sam Heiner, the executive director at the Young People's Alliance, brought me on and said, I want you to tell your story. I'll support you to do so. And mm -hmm. it has just been a whirlwind since then. That was about a year and a week ago when we first moved federally. We used to just be based in North Carolina. But mm -hmm. I will plug, because I'm very excited about this. It's not directly related. We now have 15 campuses in North Carolina registering voters, and we've already Yay. beaten a lot of our voter registration goals. So Beautiful. There's an organizing arm to all of this advocacy that I'm not directly or I'm not as involved in, but I'm very, very proud of them. Yeah, that's amazing. And we had so if listeners want to go back and hear about Ava's specific story, um, struggling with online harms, they can do that separately. We're not here to talk about that today. But um, as you're I was laughing to myself because as you're talking about Young People's Alliance, I'm like, I think I'm kind of like the old people's alliance version of you <laughs> because I'm trying to get parents to advocate and like use their voices. So it's like sort of the same thing. But yeah, because parents, I mean, I think a lot of parents are like, this is just how it is. Like we are moving forward. Like we're not going backward here. We just have to like accept that kids are going to be on devices and kids are going to be get exposed to stuff and there's nothing we can do, but there absolutely is, right? Right. And that's how young people are feeling as well. I yeah. spoke to two, four high school classes actually last week and was shocked at the way that they responded to me. Not in like a, they were just very much, what can we do about it? That's the norm. Mm -hmm. That's the norm. Yeah. Right. That is norm. Do you like it? <laughs> I'm like, right? And they were like, yeah. no. They said, <laughs> yeah. no, I don't like it. Right. You know, but that's the norm. And then my favorite is I was like, at the very end of the talk, I was like, well, some like next time you hang out with your friends, perhaps you guys should play a game and put your phone, like put your phones away and hang out off your phones and see what comes out of it and see if you like it. And there just was a unanimous, no, oh. <laughs> no. I was like, okay, well. I'm glad that what I said resonated with you. Oh, <laughs> great. Yeah. I mean, it, it did. It did get in there. I feel like with me and parents, the ones that get defensive and are like, no, that's not possible. I'm like, at least they're hearing me. And that's like the first nugget. And then over time, I think that they'll realize like, oh, she was a little bit right. <laughs> and I'm seeing these things in my kids. And it's not surprising yeah. that high schoolers are really adamant that that's not an option for them yeah. because just – a few days ago, a friend called and she does presentations for schools, like young kids. She was doing like a pre-K pre -K presentation about online safety with four-year-olds. And she asked the group of four-year-olds, how many of you use a device at night to like go to sleep? And like half of them raised their hand. So they're being trained from, you know, toddler age yeah. to use a device at, at all times. One of them said to me, which I was like it was such a brilliant statement i thought she said i think the reason we're having such a hard time responding to this is because this is the only thing we've ever known if you showed us an alternative it would be much easier for us to imagine what our life could look like without what we have right now mm -hmm. and i love that mm -hmm. because that's so much i mean that's a big project we're working on at ypa right now also is mm -hmm. trying to show people raise their expectations by showing them an alternative mm -hmm. but it did hit with me because I thought I grew up, I mean, born in 2001, like completely online. But the truth is I had an Instagram before Facebook bought it. You know, I spent a really good portion of my middle school. Like I think I wasn't on Instagram in fifth grade, sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know in the way that they do. And I felt really grateful to learn so much from them. Uh, and it motivated me. I said, well, stick around. I'll show you an alternative. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, there was that group of, in the UK, like of teenagers that stopped using their phones for a month. Um, that was really great. And then we both know Sean Killingsworth, who's doing kind of like college get togethers without mm -hmm. devices, which I think is really cool. 
So we were together in DC recently. There was a markup of the Kids Online Safety Act, but we got to um, do a little, like a small group meeting with Senator Blumenthal and John Haidt talking about like the future and what's next for kids online safety. And I brought up because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot and noticing is parents are giving their kids, I mean, usually not phones this early, usually like a watch. Parents are strapping a watch on their kid at four or five years old because they want to know where they are and they want to be able to get a hold of them in an emergency or whatever. And I just was wondering, like, I just wonder a lot how this tracking of them is going to affect them like now and in the long term. And your eyes lit up a little bit. So I wanted to chat with you about your experience being monitored or tracked through your devices and kind of what your experience was like. I want to help parents better like understand how we can protect our kids because it is a scary world like online, protect our kids in a healthy way that still fosters trust and independence. So if you could just tell us like what's your experience with monitoring around your devices. Oh, yeah. And this is Ava as Ava, who was a 15-year-old girl who got tracked on Find My Friends. Like, this is outside of the work that I do, and it's so related, but I really just wanted to share what it felt like to be a young person who was tracked. So that's yeah. the angle I'm coming at from here. So sure, I don't remember how old I was. Exa- no, it was when I got my iPhone 5C. So I was in seventh grade. Mm-hmm. And I got that little plastic green iPhone mm-hmm. and it had the tracking capability. And it was like before if Find My Friends. Pretty much it was because I was using my mom's Apple ID and she had this registered as a device of hers. So then if she wanted to find that device, that's how she was able to track me. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that there was any thought into it other than my mom knowing that I went to middle school in East Nashville, like really close to downtown. I was playing volleyball at this time, going from school to volleyball practice, you know, um, and she just wanted to be able to see where I was. Mm -hmm. So she made it a thing that I had to retract by her all the time. And I hated every minute of it. I don't know. It just felt like all I could think about when that was going on is your mom did not track you when you were 15. She didn't, she didn't track you. She didn't do that. Why do I need to be tracked? Right. And there's the, the safety piece that comes into it a hundred percent. And I am grateful that I'm safe. But as I moved into high school and got my driver's license, I think that's when it changed from like a safety thing. I want to know where you are and more to like a, let's make sure that you're being honest with me thing. You know, Mm -hmm. tell me where you're going. What party are you going to? Whose house are you going to? And I I think I said this to you when we saw each other in person. Mm-hmm. I didn't start lying to my mother until she started tracking me like that. Like yeah. we I've always had a very, very open and communicative relationship with my parents, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Mm-hmm. And I always, especially because my parents were the kind of parents that were like, if you tell us where you are, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like we just yeah. want you to be safe. So, well, and I will say, Ava, like I didn't, wasn't tracked because that functionality didn't exist on like Razor flip phones. But I mean, maybe, I don't know. But um, I also lied to my parents about where I was going on, you know, weekend nights or whatever. And sometimes I got away with it. And then sometimes I didn't. And I got in trouble. Like the time that the boys in high school took us in their cars, like racing around the track at school on the dirt. And like there was a helicopter police came and like we got in so much trouble. But like that, I learned a lot of lessons through the trial and error of lying, but like in a safe way or like knowing that like if I'm making a really bad decision, I'm going to get in trouble for it. I think it was maybe Matthew McConaughey who said this, which I love that he is in this. But yeah, <laughs> um, and his cowboy Salesforce ad. I'm like, okay, you, you're you're <laughs> almost there. Like, yes, the people who collect that are bad, but let's not monetize that and have to pay for a solution. Like, let's talk about data privacy anyway. Mm, yeah, but he said the way he thinks about social media and tracking kids and stuff is it pigeonholes them into not being able to make decisions for themselves. Yeah, so there you like. Go. Any coming of age movie ever, what happens? The main character, the 16 year old girl does something bad, gets in trouble for it and then grows from it. Mm -hmm. But she never isn't able to go out and make mistakes and then never develop. I think that's something that we run into. I mean, 
Like, what are the chicks saying? I need wide open spaces, room to grow and make mistakes. Like, it is such a known thing that we have to discover things on our own. And my mom used to say all the time, because I used to get so frustrated with my little brother, who's, I have two little brothers, but one of them is four years younger than me. And he, like, it made me really anxious when I was in college and he was in high school. And I knew that he would be, like, going out and getting in trouble or stuff. And I would always be trying to control his things, like, please be safe, please be safe, please be safe. And my mom had to remind me like, Ava, I told you all of these things that you're telling him and you didn't listen to me. You had to figure it out on your own, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't learn like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just the agency. And I think Height talks about this in his book, the agency to mess up and make mistakes and be unsupervised is where we grow as people. And The truth about it is I was probably putting myself in more dangerous situations. And I don't, okay, I don't want to out my peers and the high schoolers out there who are using the tricks on find my friends to not get tracked. Like that is not what I want to do. But I do want to shed some light on how absolutely easy it is Uh to not be tracked anymore. Like, okay, tell me. We used to. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) we, We used to say we were going to one friend's house and take our phones, like all get in the car and take our phones and put our phones in the mailbox of that one friend and then leave without our phones and go out and go party. Mm -hmm. And the crazy thing is the tracking aspect is obviously for safety, right? Mm -hmm. We were so much more unsafe feeling like we needed to not be tracked and lied to our parents by putting our phones in the mailbox Mm -hmm. because then we didn't have our phones. Right. And right. then if something did hit the fan, who, who's got the phone to call? Yeah. None of us. And no one has landlines anymore because yes. you couldn't. Where at least when I was lying about where I was and I would have another friend's like older sister pretend to be the mom mm-hmm. of the where I was going and my mom would call that person and she would pretend to be the mom and say, yes, yes, she's staying here and all mature. Um, but, but then wherever we were, we had a landline phone if something went down. I mean, we didn't, I don't know that we ever had to like use it, but. Right. And we never had, I mean, thank goodness we never had anything go wrong. But the other thing we would do is we would have our old phones. So, like I had my iPhone 5C, but now I have my iPhone 8, right? Mm-hmm. And you can mess around in the location services because, and I will remind the parents, like, You'll never be as technically savvy as your kid will be, like period. You won't. Yep. But we would mess around with the location services and we called it a trap phone or like mm-hmm. a trap iPad. Come. And you go into the location services and you change it to where it's emitting the location from the other phone. And I'm, I please do not go at your kids and say, I know that you're lying because this girl told me on the podcast that <laughs> that's not what I want you to do. But yeah. I'm just telling you, yeah, it's a thing. And we changed it to the trap phone and then we would like leave the trap phone at whoever's front porch or like leave like if I was going to sneak out of the house which my parents know now that I did Mm -hmm. I would leave my trap phone under my bed and then take my phone with me Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. vice versa I would leave my phone phone and take my trap phone so that I can still take pictures and post on Instagram all the drinking that I'm doing obviously Mm -hmm. because I am cool of course you have to you have to show everyone how cool you are (laughs) exactly so (laughs) and then I would like you would never be able to know where I was. Um, yeah. But then my trap phone doesn't connect and it doesn't have service too. So then I can't call or text on it. So yeah. you think I'm in one place, but mm-hmm. in reality, I'm in another place. And I just feel like that's even more dangerous mm-hmm. because then if you're going to like, you think I'm sleeping peacefully at home, mm-hmm. but if I'm not, yeah. when in reality, you know, Like, obviously, no one wants their kids underage drinking, but, I mean, Gen Z drinks less than anyone ever before. Mm -hmm. Who knows about Gen Mm -hmm. Alpha, which, I mean, is honestly kind of cool, but. Yeah. There's definitely multiple sides to it. And what's interesting about that, and I will add, is that same concept with the trap phone. When I asked Mm -hmm. my little brother, who's 17 now, he was maybe Mm -hmm. 16 then, what would you do if you had to put your phone in a cubby at the beginning of school every day? He would say, I would bring my old phone, put that in the cubby and then sneak my real phone so I could use it in the bathroom. Yeah. And we know kids are doing this, but it's still, we still need to be collecting phones at school. And yeah. then when he gets in oh, trouble yeah. for using his phone, which he will at some point, like hopefully he'll stop doing that. But like I, there's this thing about like fostering 
independence in the child and like trust and letting them like make their own mistakes and not being all over them to where they can't even make a mistake and learn from that mistake. Can you imagine if your parents had been tracking your location since you were five, five years old? And that's where I get really off put. Yeah. But I think what's crazy is we don't know how that's going to turn out because if you are tracked since you're five years old, you never know what it was to be not tracked. I think that a child who grew up always being tracked would feel very, very reliant on their yeah. parents and it would be hard for them to learn independence and trust for themselves. I think that's a big part is like my friends that had Life360, I'm sure you're aware of Life360. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because that one was even harder to finagle your way out of. Like that was the one that you really had to leave your phone in the mailbox because mm-hmm. there was no way to get out of Life360. Mm-hmm. Um, but my friends who had Life360, I think, didn't have the same self-assuredness that they could go out into the world and be safe. They were much more timid about doing stuff and yeah it did also lead to a certain sense of social isolation and i i it's the same problem we run into with if you give one kid an instagram the rest of the kids are going to want an instagram Mm -hmm. if one parent doesn't track their kid and that kid can go do whatever they want on the weekends Mm -hmm. then there is always going to be that kid who does get tracked and then can't go to the party and on one side it's like oh maybe it's good that they're not partying but on the other side it's like All of their peers are having formative experiences. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? And what's the alternative, you know? And you, parent, also did that. Like, let's not pretend that we didn't go to parties. (laughs) That's my biggest thing. And I used to be so mad. Your mom didn't track you. And my mom would say the tech wasn't available then. She would have if it was available. And I understood that. I understood where my mom was coming from. She wanted me to be safe. And now I will say that... Three out of four of my siblings are out of high school and college. I love knowing that my mom has my location now as an adult. Sure. And when before she goes to bed, she says she loves to check on her dots and make sure all of her dots are in the right place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's different. And that's different. Yeah. That's different than like tracking a a five year old or a 10 year old or a 15 year old. And also, just because you can do something with tech doesn't mean you should. Like we shouldn't jump feet first into these technological advancements and strapping tech on our kids without really thinking it through. And also our kids shouldn't be guinea pigs with this stuff. And the same thing all about like the tech at school, like school issued device conversation is separate, but also applies. I am interviewing next week, Lenore Skenazy, who has an organization called Let Grow, and she has a book called Free Range Kids. But I'm going to make sure that this, her interview lines up right after yours, because I think that this, like, she has so many resources for parents who want to find that balance of letting our kids use tech safely, maybe doing some monitoring, but also giving them really important opportunities to go out and do things on their own, learn independence. She says, like, let go to let grow. And I love her message. So we've talked about like tracking your location, but what about monitoring what you're doing on your device? Did, and maybe it was too early for this. So your mom wasn't checking like what you were doing on your devices. I think the most important thing to add there is it has evolved so much. And I think I talked about this in the last episode we did. My mom was so concerned about what I was posting. She would make me give her my phone mm-hmm. so that she could see what I was posting. Never once did she ever think to check the posts that I was looking at Mm -hmm. and what I was receiving. And that's where we got into trouble because Mm -hmm. I would get in trouble for like, I'm trying to even think of something that I posted that I got in trouble for, Mm -hmm. like just like the stupidest stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about how cool it is to be a teenager and drinking online. So when my mom would see that I was like drinking a Bud Light Mm -hmm. or something, she'd be like, Ava, this is not okay, obviously. But she never looked at the posts that I was getting recommended. And that was because where I was really getting harmed online wasn't because I was posting a picture of my Bud Light. Mm -hmm. I was getting in trouble because of the posts that were being recommended to me. So no, she couldn't monitor me. But even when she did monitor me, it wasn't in the way that was conducive to protecting me Mm -hmm. um, online. And then we all know about the Finsta. The minute my mom started looking at what I posted online, I make a fake account that she doesn't follow and could never discover because it's private. 
mm-hmm. and start posting even worse stuff on there. I mean, the stuff, Nikki, that we would post on our Finstas is we wouldn't post that on regular Instagram before we thought we had something to hide. When we talk about seeing what it is that kids are doing online, I think it's essentially the same conversation about tracking them in real life. Mm -hmm. If you don't trust them to do the right thing online, then they don't trust themselves to do the right thing online, Mm -hmm. you know? And then that uncertainty can lead people to make poor decisions, you know? Yeah. And the thing, and I, I want to be able to trust that my child, if I give them social media, is going to, when faced with something harmful, going to be like, oh, I, that is harmful. But the problem is that kids don't know what's bad when they see it. And that Harris, yeah, Harrison Haynes made that point. Like, and in the platform, ideally, you know, iMessage is like, should be blurring nudity and or not letting you see it or whatever, using some functionality to be like, this is harmful. And you should report or talk to a parent giving you some, some resources. But generally, the social media companies don't do a great job of that. Some do better than others. So I just don't trust the social media companies to educate my child on what's good and bad. So my thought is they're not going to be on it unless I can guarantee that they're going to be protected from really like harmful and deadly content. What do you think? Do you think kids need to be introduced to when it comes to social media, like at some point, or are we just like, let's keep them off of it as long as we can? Well, I'm always like, ban it. (laughs) Ban it. I know. Ban it. (laughs) No. But the genie is out of the bottle, right? It's way too late for that. And there are so many good things to come out of social media. People learn things about themselves, the way that you can express yourself. Like if you're an artist and you can post your art online or you can meet people that you didn't know, you can like discover this whole world out there. And when I was talking to the high schoolers last week, that's something they brought up is it's really, really cool to that me that I can see what's going on on the other side of the world. Yeah. So those are the positive things. I do think, though, as far as being exposed to really negative content, that's why we need digital literacy. That's why we need people like Lars from Half the Story doing social media. You, who if you haven't talked to yet, you should definitely talk to. And I can make that connection. But who goes through and explains what bad content is and what good content is. But the problem about that is even after we've identified what good or bad content is, I can report bad content all day long and Instagram won't stop showing it to me because they know that's what engages me. So to answer Mm -hmm. your question, I mean, this is like the age old question, right? I think that we can be intentional about engaging with tech as a family, but maybe we shouldn't be doing endless scroll under the covers of the bed alone, you know? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that isn't to say if you have like a 17 year old daughter she can't scroll on Instagram without you looking over her shoulder because that's not realistic. Right. But there are photo sharing platforms out there that don't have the algorithm. Visco, for example, I think we've forgotten as a group of people about Visco. That's the one social media I still have, VSCO. Okay. And yeah. it doesn't show like you, people can't even see if anyone's liked your photo or reposted it, but you can repost people's pictures and you can favorite them. Mm-hmm. And you can like photo or you can post pictures and the only pictures you see are the people you follow in your feed. So Hmm. there are options out there, but then it's the social, I mean, it's whatever the norm is. You can't, it's going to be so hard to have a mass exodus of people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, so you mentioned there's an answer. No, there's not a there's not a good answer. That's why we're all advocating for platforms or sorry, for legislation to make the platform safer. So you mentioned that your mom wasn't looking at the right things when with regard to keeping you safe on social media because she just didn't know to do that. So talk a little bit more about that. Like what should parents be looking for if they're gonna check on their kids' social media? Right. I don't think it's as much who they're following or who they're messaging. I mean, obviously there is a problem with grooming on social media. And, but I mean, Instagram just rolled out that new feature to allow parents to see the accounts that people are messaging, which is very interesting. Um, Um, But the kids can opt out of it if they want to. They just leave it. It's called supervision and any age kid can just turn it off. We are so weird. (laughs) I know. And the crazy thing is we could just make a better platform. Like, 
I know there are so many people working on it and that's such a stupid statement to say like, oh, Lego Blitter platform, what does that look like? Yeah. It looks like Visco, what I just talked about. Yeah. You know, I, I don't. Anyway, um, I think if my mom had clicked on that little magnifying glass, my Explore page, that's what she should have seen because that's the okay. content that was getting spoon fed to me, that Explore page, not yeah. the accounts I was following, not the people I'm messaging, who is Instagram recommending to me because that's what was harmful. I also think there was a certain, and this is kind of cloudy for me because I don't really remember all that well, some of the really, like when I was really deep in it in high school. But I think that if she had seen my, like clicked on the search bar and seen my recent searches mm -hmm. and clicked on one of those and see saw where that would take me, that might have given her a better idea too of the kind of content that I was being exposed to because mm -hmm. what happens is you get recommended this really, really harmful content and then that becomes your reality because you're assuming, oh, if this platform is showing it to me, I should be seeing this. Like mm -hmm. this is what I'm supposed to be seeing online. Mm -hmm. Why would they recommend this to me if it wasn't? And then the next step is starting to engage with that content on your own, right? It's yeah. not like I ever searched for eating disorder content and then got an eating disorder. I right. recommended eating disorder content, got an eating disorder, and then reinforced the eating disorder through searching for it. So that's what I would say is the explore page in, in the search. Yeah. And I think it's, is it Spotlight on Snapchat? You might not know because you don't have Snapchat, but, and then I think it's For You on Instagram. Yep. That's that. Okay. Or, yeah. Ex for You TikTok, Explore page on Instagram. Snapchat okay. has one now. Oh yeah, they have. That's where I signed up as a 14 year old. And within like five minutes of scrolling, I'm being served videos from inside of a strip club. Like, and they think I'm 14 and have no information on me. <laughs> I can't. And now but, they're trying to make a simplified Snapchat where your spotlight recommended videos and your friends videos snaps are one feed. So you're just scrolling and getting in the same feed, your friends and the spotlight recommended videos. So it's harder, even harder for kids to stay away well, from the bad stuff. From this conversation, like I want parents to just think long and hard, really assess whether or not it's time to give their kids a device that can track them or really even if they have it, like how much are we checking it? How much are we talking to them about it? Making sure we're balancing out, like fostering their independence and the trust between you and the child rather than just being all over them regarding like where they are. Are they where they said they were going to be? Did they lie? Like I just think that's a recipe for disaster. And I oh, yeah. am curious how that's going. To, this is going to affect kids, a whole generation of children as they get older and they've literally never been able to be alone and know that they're alone and able to have the freedom to do what they want to do. So this whole conversation is like developing and new and fascinating to me. But is there anything else we didn't like cover regarding your experience or any thoughts you have around this that we didn't share yet? I just want to really iterate like if you are going to look at what your kid is seeing on their explore page, do it with them. Mm -hmm. And don't do it in a way that forces their hand. Like these should be conversations that are happening on a two-way street. And I think if you can get vulnerable with your young person and say, look, I have no idea what this is. I wasn't on this when I was your age. Like mm -hmm. this is new. This is has never been dealt with before. And as a parent, it makes me I feel anxious. I notice I'm feeling anxiety about how you're utilizing this product. Mm -hmm. Can you help me with that? Can you help me understand what this is? Yeah. I think something else is that's really would be helpful is flipping the script. And instead of like, what can your kid do for you to help you feel more comfortable about their online experience, flipping it? What can, I, mean, I sound like John F. Kennedy, but like, what can I do for you as a parent <laughs> that will help yeah. you feel more comfortable telling me about the harms that you might be experiencing. I love online. it. Yeah. You know, like what can I do for you as a parent? And we talk about that, like this is flipping the question like that has been such a huge theme in my advocacy work. Mm -hmm. Like I don't go into offices and say, you need to do this for me. I'm like, mm -hmm. what can I do for you that would make it easier for you to sign on to this bill, you know? And yeah. just that like little piece of psychology, I think is very, very helpful. Yeah. And I think we've realized this, and this was a huge thing that I learned at the online harms conference I was at in Canada last week. Taking the kid's phone away, I just think is a bad idea at this point because of how addictive they are. Mm -hmm. Like if someone is an alcoholic and you take their alcohol away and they do not receive the proper physical health support to withstand mm -hmm. that, that is a very, very, very hard 
physical thing on the body. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it goes back to the beginning conversation when we were talking about my little brother maybe giving the fake phone. Mm-hmm. Why do you have to take your phone into the bathroom with you mm-hmm. if you are not addicted to it, right? We used to go into the bathroom at school and like jewel. Like I'm adding myself here. Mm-hmm. Thought that was the coolest thing in the world to have a jewel. That's what I was posting on my Finsta is a jewel. Mm-hmm. But yeah. that's because that was nicotine and right. that is an addictive substance. It's if you're you're exhibiting like addictive behaviors. Mm-hmm. And I just I think that it's really important to keep that in mind you can't just take it away we've had a lot of young people like really harm themselves after they've gotten their Mm -hmm. phone taken away like that it should be really a two-way street and i think being vulnerable and saying look i don't know anything about this Mm -hmm. and you can take advantage of me you can take advantage of that if you want sure Mm -hmm. but i want to be a team working through this together Mm -hmm. yeah um i think that's so important and when it comes to the tracking thing i just recognize that and I again I always have to disclaim I'm not a parent but I was a kid recognize that <laughs> your, your kid putting their phone in a mailbox so they can go to a party and then not having any way of communicating with you at that party is more dangerous than them going to that party yeah and that's my crippling period like that's that's <laughs> yeah. it that's yeah. it so it's the problem with efficiency right all this tech is making our lives so much more efficient. But when you make things more efficient, you think that you're going to do them less. Mm-hmm. You know, when you make something more efficient, you do it more, right? Mm-hmm. When you make it easier to surveil your kid, you're going to do it more. So and I just, social media doesn't make your life any more efficient. It makes everything take longer because you're on social media and that's not producing anything at all. <laughs> yeah, literally. Like I, I don't know. I talk to people all the time about like every minute you consume is a minute you're not creating. Yeah. And that's right. not, and I think I also want to add to, which is so important, is that layer of defensiveness that any child is going to feel over their tech use yeah. because they understand that it is problematic. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. E- even if, and that's why I might have had trouble connecting with those high schoolers last week is because, and I, I tried to be so cognizant about bringing this conversation to them in a way that wasn't finger pointing and blaming, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. At the end of the day, like it's really hard to address personal behaviors without being slightly finger pointing. So, yeah, yeah, something very easy. It's part of it. But I've noticed it's saying I've noticed, not saying you use your phone too much. I've noticed that in the past week you've been on your phone a lot. Mm -hmm. You need to do your homework before you get on your phone. I've noticed that it's easier for you to get your homework done Mm -hmm. if you do it before phone. Yeah. You know, that I've noticed is so important. And that's another thing that just really small language thing that makes Mm -hmm. a world of difference. Like not you're being weird, you're acting weird. Are you lying to me? I've noticed that your behavior has been a little bit off in this past week. It opens it up for like a conversation that's like requires a response and it opens it up. Um, I want to note that you're not like overstating the addictiveness of these phones and taking it away can have negative, really bad consequences. I have an interview with Jenny Desario, whose son, Mason Edens, she took away his phone. He died by suicide because she took it away. There's another story of a young girl, 14-year-old, who her mom took away her phone so she can get a good night's sleep. She died by suicide overnight with this suicide note saying, you shouldn't have taken away my phone. So we're like... That's why, though, I will be delaying because I feel like every year or every month or every day I delay giving them access to something that that is that addictive is allowing them to develop those brain skills, the skills to like deal with life without having that out, not have addictive tendencies um, that can often lead to addiction to other things in the future. So the delay thing is really important here, but also like if your kid already has the phone, like we have to be very careful about yeah. when and how we take it away or give them breaks. And I also love your thought about letting them lead. Like, and Harrison Haynes said that, like, let them lead the conversation. We, no one expects us parents to know more than them about the social media apps that they're spending time on or even their phone. And so be curious, 
let them teach you about it. And then it's a different strategy to be able to see what they're seeing and have open conversations in a engage trustworthy on way. The positives. Engage yeah. On engage on the positives, right? Like, that was cool. Well, that was so funny. Like look at the vid- the funny yeah. stuff with them too. Don't just be looking out for the harm. It's going to be so much easier for a parent to get access to the phone if it's because you want to see like a funny meme or something. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? Or if it's because like, what is your favorite thing about social media? And I think I said this last time I was going to episode two like if you if i ask kids and i do this all the time what is your favorite thing about social media oftentimes i don't even have to ask them what their least favorite thing is mm-hmm. they'll just automatically start saying it so <laughs> that's very very important um to go through but i'm not a parent but like i talk to my 17 year old brother about this all the time and he mm-hmm. just schools me on it they're they're just living in a completely different world and we yeah. can never even i who also lived in that world I have one foot in both. We'll never understand. Okay. So it's like so much about honesty, open conversations, transparency, vulnerability, letting them lead, being vulnerable, not freaking out if they did see something bad or like do something bad on there. You're the safe space. Have that open and honest relationship, Um, especially as they're getting to be like 16, 17. It's like sort of like you can't keep them away from it. They're going to figure out how to get access to it anyway, even if you've tried to restrict them. So this is their, I mean, we could talk forever, but I have another interview in a minute. So I'm (laughs) going to let it close this out. Um, Ava, I so appreciate your perspective on this. I love getting your youth perspective. (laughs) You know, you're, what are you, 23? I'm 23 Two. now. You're 23. I feel so old. No, no, no. <laughs> you are not. Um, but I can't wait to see you in person again soon. Yes. And we'll have to figure out when that's going to be uh, maybe yes. at, um, well, Project Liberty's Summit. Yes. Anyway. Oh, yeah. that's when it'll For be. For sure that. I'll okay. be there then. Okay. okay Ava, perfect. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, oh, where can parents connect with you? YPA or youngpeoplesalliance.org? Youngpeoplesalliance.org. I'm on LinkedIn, Ava Smithing. I'm pretty good at responding to my DMs there. Um, I'm Ava at youngpeoplesalliance.org. Okay. Thank you, Ava.